for those of us that um, care about him, I guess I should say, luckily he transitioned a bit more out of the underground mining from day to day. And he's now a consultant that does roof control and ventilation to make the mine safer for current miners. Um, my mother is retired. She's a retired math teacher. I think it was Mary Beth a few weeks ago that might have mentioned it's really difficult to go to school with a place where your mom teaches, and she is not wrong. Um, I'll take that a step further. I actually had mom in class for two and a half years, so that was quite interesting. Um, teenage Russell was not happy about that. Adult Russell actually appreciates it and enjoyed the, uh, the time. It was some good stories, got some funny stories for a later date. Um, I graduated with about 70-ish students, so it was a very small school. Um, what the small school lacked in resources to provide to the students that actually made up for I feel, and that you could really plug yourself into any kind of extracurricular activity you chose. So, you know, I was senior class president, I was on the football team, four years, right? Um, Homecoming Court actually had a fairly large role in a couple of school plays at the drama club. So very small school. Unfortunately, after those glory days, the NFL wasn't really looking for five foot nine offensive linemen. Um, Hollywood wasn't knocking my door down for a role for a Southern West Virginia kid with a thick accent and two years of high school play experience, maybe a face for radio, I don't know. So I needed a backup plan. Um, the backup plan, I went to Marshall University. I studied geology, I got a bachelor's degree in geology with an emphasis in engineering geology and minored in math while I was there. Um, the late 90s was a really fun time to be at Marshall. If anybody follows football, that was the Chad Hennington, Byron Left, which Randy Moss years. So that was that was fun. After graduating from Marshall, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. Um, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, got accepted to Duke University PhD program in geology. So I decided to move to North Carolina as well. So North Carolina, um, lived there for four years, worked for a company called CTL Engineering. They're actually headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, with offices throughout Ohio, but at the time they had a North Carolina office. I was a geologist project manager there. On my own time in North Carolina, I was a North Carolina barbecue aficionado. It kind of changed my life. It changed my pant size. <laughs> a few times, maybe. Most of it's came back off. Some of it still lingers. So after four years in North Carolina, um, my wife, who was my fiance at the time, so we got engaged in, um, took a two year temporary teaching position at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, so, knowing that was going to be a temporary stop, two year stop, I thought it was the perfect time for me to go back to school myself. So, at the time, I thought I wanted to be a school teacher, following mom's footsteps. Um, I enrolled in Shippensburg University and got certified to teach earth space science, general science, integrated science. After doing some student teaching and some substitute teaching, it was clear that was not the path for me. Uh, <laughs> so God bless the teachers. It's a tough job, you know, God bless you. That was not for me. Fortunately, while I was at Shippensburg, I also did a master's degree in geo-environmental studies. So it's sort of a degree program they offer through professors that have backgrounds in geology, geography, environmental science. That's where I got exposed to GIS for the first time. Anybody know what GIS is? Quite a few, good. If you don't, it's geographic information systems. Um, I guess the simplest explanation is digital mapping, computer mapping, much more than that. It's uh, database management, database design, spatial analytics, statistics. It's, Really, the, the science of where, so you can take almost any data set. Once you put a spatial context to it, you start seeing these connections and these things that you couldn't really pick out in the detector. That's where I was first exposed to GIS. Um, after our time in Pennsylvania, after those two years were up, my wife, who was my wife at the time, so we got married in Pennsylvania, um, took a position at the College of Worcester in their geology program. So that's what brought me to Ohio, that's what brought me to Worcester. 
my first job in Worcester. I don't think she's here today, but was actually working for D by D at Technographics. So I was with Technographics through the CACI acquisition. I was with Technographics for CACI, I should say, when they closed the doors in 2014. So there's there's not a lot that I'm more sure of than the Tuesday that CACI closed had to be the highest grossing, highest sales day ever for Leroy's. Um, <laughs> so I got home at 9.30 in the morning on a Tuesday. All my work stuff was in a cardboard box. And I got a call from a friend. He said, hey, we're going to Leroy's for a drink. You should stop by. So I had two thoughts. My first was it's 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> My second was, well, my schedule kind of cleared itself. So I stopped by and I walked in and literally there were people eating pancakes and drinking the yingling. And I kid you not, 70 coworkers showed up. I left at 7 p.m. and the place was still packed. So, you know, it's tough for CACI employees. It was quite the victory for, for Leroy's, I suppose. Um, so after CACI closed, I bounced around for a bit. Um, I worked for a year or two associates in North Canton, Ohio, um, civil engineering firm doing GIS for oil and gas after the Marcellus and Munich Michelle hit. I was there for a year. I worked for two years for Lorraine Medina Rural Electric in Wellington, Ohio, doing GIS still, um, updating their maps that hadn't been updated in probably 10 years. Enjoyed that job, actually wasn't looking for another job. But then the GIS director position for Wayne County, which happens to be in the auditor's office, became available. And given my interest, I didn't mention, but my master's research was doing regression analysis and statistical modeling for house prices. So given my interest in that, my interest in geology, or GIS rather, it seemed like, and this was a mile from my house instead of an hour down the road, you know, you had to apply for this job. So I applied, I interviewed, I did not get the job. So, all right, back to the job that I was enjoying. Six months later, the position came open again. So I applied a second time, interviewed a second time, and got the job a second time. So I've been there for going on seven years now. Um, the most visible thing I guess I do at the auditor's office is the website. So I work with the company that provides the website for the data management, but then the mapping portion of it, we do 100% in house. I do that myself and update that nightly. So that's the most visible thing. Um, that website shockingly gets about 15,000 hits a day with about 2,000 different users each day hits that website. So that's by far the most visible thing. Um, beyond that, do some application, make some apps for our users and appraisers to use in-house and in the field, um, do some statistical analysis, analytics. Outside of the auditor's office, my department does a lot of GIS work for the county, so we do the data for 911 dispatch. It's enough to work off with the county's dispatch. Um, we do work for EMA, the engineer's office, soil and water, building codes, the planning department. So several departments throughout the county. So it's an interesting job, challenging. Um, I find it fun, but it's, it's worthwhile. I, I think I'll be there for a while. Stop bouncing around so much. I'm going to get a reputation. So for fun, outside of work, what I like to do, um, I like to go do woodworking. It's rewarding for me to make something with your hands and you know visualize it and then see it, you know, in in person. For the same reason, home improvement projects I enjoy. We remodeled our house top to bottom when we bought it. I put together a a, a one year schedule and promptly knocked that out in five years. So. Yeah. so it was good. It was good. We enjoy hiking and camping. Next month, we're going on a two-week road trip up through Acadia, Maine, and the White Mountains in New Hampshire, Vermont. So we like to hike and camp. I like to read. Um, brew my own beer. We've actually got four taps in our basement. So ironically, I drink less now than when I did not have four taps in my basement, which you can just go get a little bit. Um, so, so that's fun. We went further down the bourbon rabbit hole than I ever anticipated. So we probably got. 50 or 60 bottles of bourbon at the house. Also, don't drink that often, but when I do, we have quite the selection, more so than most bars in town. Yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, thank you for accepting me in the Rotary, and I look forward to meeting each of you over the coming weeks and months.
Thank you. Thank you, Russ. We appreciate it. Very impressive. And welcome to the Rotary. Now, our program will be introduced by Cheryl Hall. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Brian Ritchie is the president of Worcester Youth Baseball. He's responsible for Wayne County's Little League chapter, as well as other baseball programs such as T-ball and fall ball and the Worcester Community All-Star Tournament teams. He is a longtime youth sports coach who believes in building youth of character over wins and losses. In addition to baseball, he also coaches AAU basketball with the Buckeye Blast organization. Throughout his life, Brian has held community service as a core value. He is a member of Worcester Kiwanis, past president of St. Mary's Parish Council, travels across the United States and Canada as a national speaker for Kiwanis Key Leader Program. Also, he is a longtime advocate for Ronald McDonald House Charities. Professionally, Brian serves as a senior IT leader at Union Home Mortgage. He's responsible for a wide portfolio of software applications that help the community or the company process mortgages for their customers. Previously, he has led IT for Grange Insurance, Western Reserve Group, and Westfield Insurance. He resides in Worcester and is happily devoted to his three children, Jack, 17, Brooke, 14, and Alex, 12. In his spare time, I don't know how he has any spare time, but he enjoys a variety of outdoor sports, traveling the United States, and cheers on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Please welcome Brian. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate the introduction. Um, it's so great to be here today, and, and I really appreciate uh, you guys asking us back to talk about Worcester Youth Baseball. Um, it's a wonderful thing to come to Rotary because there are a lot of friendly faces here, a lot of supporters of the program, um, whether you've been a coach, whether you've mowed grass, or whether you financially supported us in some way. We, we definitely want to say thank you for that. Um, I especially want to thank Greg and his son, Matt, for the longtime support and, and advice that they've given us over the years um, that has really led to what we're doing and what we're about to talk about today. Um, if you've driven by Miller Fields over the past couple months, you might have thought it was an ODOT-sponsored project, but I assure you, we, we were not the people that closed down Friendsville Road. Uh, instead, we are working on changing and renovating the fields at Miller, and as you probably have noticed as you've driven by, um, two-thirds of that project are nearly complete. And so I'm going to talk today about what we have finished so far and what the plan is for the upcoming year. So to date, uh, we've finished one of our fields, the one that's known as Denton Fuller, that was finished last fall and has served this summer as our primary field while the other renovations are going on. Um, that field uh, had games played on it for six days a week, uh, all throughout the spring and summer. Um, and then in addition to that, we also tried to find places all around the city of Worcester to uh, support the, the fields that we didn't have to play. But uh, Denton Fuller has been a great addition with its renovation, and uh, everyone's really enjoying the all dirt field. Um, at this point, we're in the progress of finishing what has traditionally been known as North and South Miller. I'm going to talk about those in, in a moment. Uh, we're also uh, in the process of working with the city to get our architectural plans done for the concession stand and our, and our equipment building. And we are now starting our phase three and four fundraising to work on what is known as the practice field, as well as uh, the light replacement that we need to do uh, at Miller. So going back to uh, North and South, uh, these fields are very close to being done. We've completed the excavation, the drainage and the fencing for those uh, fields. Um, a lot of that work and funding for that um, was done by two large donations uh, by the Ralph and Grace Jones Foundation, as well as with Scheffler Group. Those two groups were the primary groups responsible for making sure that those fields uh, become a reality. And we are very close uh, as we're getting to the middle of August um, and the temperatures are starting to move down where we can actually grow the grass. We decided not to grow grass in the middle of July because if you live in Ohio long enough, you know nobody's grass lives during that time of year. So that's about to occur here in September, uh, getting both the grass and the infield set. 
And then all that will be left for those two fields before next spring uh, is to fund and implement uh, the dugouts as well as the bleachers for those fields. And we're looking for groups like Rotary or anybody else that would like to, to help us maybe figure out how to fund these. Uh, next we're, project we're right in the middle of getting started is the concession stand. This building will be a 24 by 50 building. Um, it has uh, expanded bathrooms and ADA access, which the old building did not have. Uh, we, this is also made possible by a major donation, this time by the Noble Foundation um, that has made this a possibility to get this done this fall. Um, as part of this, uh, we are going to be renovating the whole inside. You know, if, if you have ever been to Miller Field and, and walked into that concession stand, um, you could tell it was built in, in the, the 70s or the 60s because all the equipment's about that old too. Uh, but with the renovation, we're able to replace all that equipment, get everything brand new, and it'll make for a really great experience, including a nice pavilion for the families that come to watch the games and get under shade when it's a hot day. Um, that project's scheduled to complete by the end of November. Another building that we're gonna be putting in will replace the old blue building. For those of you that are familiar with the old layout, uh, this one will be a 24 by 48 new construction, uh, largely funded by the private donations that we've been collecting over the past several years. Uh, this is gonna be where we, we keep everything else. Basically our lawn mowers, our Ventrac machine, chalk, dirt, you name it, it's gonna be in that building. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a key part of the renovation so that we actually can have everything under cover and, and then be able to keep the fields maintained with all that equipment and storage. Uh, while all of that's going on this fall, um, we now have to turn our attention on the board to start figuring out how we're going to take care of the remainder of the, of the complex. And so the phase three of this pro project is to move on to the fourth and final field. Uh, the one that's historically been known as the practice field. Traditionally, this field's been made, been used by our key ball and coach pitch players, so the littlest of the little. Uh, and so the goal for this phase three is to expand that field so that it can take care of not only the little guys and gals, but also our 10 youth players, so that it'll take care of everybody from four to 10 years old with that expansion. Uh, the only groups that won't be able to play on that field is our older majors players, our 11 to 12 year olds, because they would hit it out of the fence probably every time they swung the bat at the side of the field. But uh, the majority of our, of our people that are in the program, though, will be able to take advantage of this once that uh, phase is complete. And the other real benefit of this uh, particular phase is we're going to be adding another storage building as well as a pavilion on that end of the, of the complex, um, because there are a lot of people that are down on that end and they have to walk all the way down to the other side of the field or the complex to go pick up a rake or get a bag of, of chalk or whatever it is that they might need to do. Uh, but by putting that building down there and it gives some shade for the folks that are watching their little tykes uh, play baseball, uh, we're gonna make sure that, that that is taken care of as well for those families. And then the fourth and final phase of the project is to replace the field lights. Uh, prior to the renovation, we had three separate fields that had field lights. Um, all of those lighting systems were uh, past their age and needed to be retired. Um, we are keeping our hands crossed and our fingers crossed and our hands held that our debt and fuller lights remain because they're still there and they haven't blown up on us yet. Um, but the other two fields, uh, they really needed to be replaced. And so we ended up taking those down as part of the renovations. And so we need to, we need to start raising funds to replace those so we can have night baseball uh, when tournaments and fall baseball come around. So to date, you know, we've been able to raise with both pledges and donations, uh, close to half a million dollars. Uh, total expenses, if we do everything, would be around $773,000. So we've made a pretty good debt. Um, the main expense left are the lights. Um, they're about somewhere in the ballpark of 250 to 300,000. So that's a significant money amount. We'll implement, implement those as we make the money. So you know, when we get enough to make do the first field, we'll do it. And then we'll just keep working our way around until we complete the project. Uh, but all in all, we are super excited about the future of, of youth baseball here in, in Worcester. Um, with the work that's been done and the support that we've gotten from the community, um, these fields should be able to serve the, the youth of, of Worcester for at least the next 30 to 40 years. And, and we're really excited about that progress. So thank you in advance for everything that you've done to help us move forward with that. And if you have any interest in, in helping out with the remaining phases or any other aspect of the program, feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to get you in touch with the right people.
So with that, I'll open it up to questions. So either I did a good job, Greg, or they're sleeping. I'm not sure which. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Well, I, I spent uh, my whole youth in one of those fields, and then most of my adult life, I got recruited as a coach while I was still in college in 1970, and didn't get out of there until 2004. So I coached the Worcester Glass team for 34 years. And then Brian came along, and uh, he's done a great job, and it's a, it's a big challenge. It's one of the few youth baseball programs in the country that isn't run by the city. It's run by a separate 501c3. Now, cities don't have to do that. They run a lot of other programs, uh, but Worcester Youth Baseball has uh, been quite a success story over the years. And uh, my father-in-law uh, supported it, obviously, and... Uh, when my mother-in-law died in 1997, she donated the money for the lights that are currently there. So it's time, definitely time for them to go. So Brian, in appreciation for your being present and talking to us today, uh, I'll present you with a rendition of the Rotary Wheel with the four-way test on back made locally by the students of the Rotary Network. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Okay, we're almost done. I'm going to get you out of here early. Now, next week, as I mentioned, we have the district governor coming, Michelle Charlie. Uh, the board will be meeting with her at 11, and then she will be a greeter, and then she will present the program. Um, I do want to thank uh, uh, everyone today for uh, the, the support that they gave the Meals with a Mission. But all of our fundraising, what all our members do for the flags, they're the unsung heroes a lot of times. My goodness, the amount of time they put on. Um, I would mention that Brent came up about the exchange students. It is absolutely my favorite program in Rotary. And I hope a lot of you can take them on a trip or do something with them because when they go back, they'll remember them. And uh, so please, if you can take them with you or include them in an event, it's well worth your time. Uh, the board, we have our board uh, meeting this Wednesday at the Worcester Country Club. So have a great week. Stand adjourned.